Um, very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Mickey Pentecost from Diadem today to present. Um, and we'll get started with that. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, first, I wanted to provide a brief introduction into um, uh, Spectralize technology and provide some context for why we're here. And then we'll get to what you really came for uh, in a minute. So uh, if you're not familiar with Spectrodyne yet, uh, our company makes uh, new instrumentation for nanoparticle analysis. Uh, and our mission is to reshape the discovery, development, and production of modern therapeutics, basically through better measurements. And this accurate quantification is critical because of a variety of reasons. We're here because of EVs, and uh, you're working with EVs or maybe LMPs also. Uh, for any one of their multitude of potential applications, right? One of them is as therapeutics, and that's what Mickey will talk about today. Um, and they're also useful potentially as biomarkers and um, for understanding fundamental biology, right? These applications are growing rapidly. EVs are quickly developing field. And at this size scale, at the nano scale, uh, it's important to recognize that even fundamental properties like the size and concentration of these particles dictate their behavior very strongly. So the property the properties of the aggregate material, the therapeutic that you're working on, um, or the, the biodistribution or the biological behavior of these particles um, are strongly impacted by basic physical things like size and concentration. As you very clearly see, right, the size and concentration of EVs as a therapeutic directly impact the dose, right? It's the amount of material that is in your formulation. So that's an obvious one, um, but they're also related to biodistribution, for example. And in addition to size and concentration, uh, it's important to be able to quantify the cargo that these are carrying. That's also related to the dose, also their potency, um, and ultimately the safety and efficacy of the therapeutics that we're working with here. So size, concentration, and cargo, uh, that's the active ingredients or the recognizing the targeting features are three critical quality attributes that, um, that Spectrodyne focuses on for uh, effective EV research and nanomedicines in general. I'd like to highlight that with a scientific example. This is kind of a canonical example. It doesn't matter what kind of material you're working with. The scenario is that you're uh, trying to compare two formulations, A and B. So maybe these are engineered products and you're comparing to a control, or maybe you're just trying to optimize your formulation and you want to see which one does better. So we've got two formulations, A and B, and uh, typically we'll test these by applying them to a test system, a model system. In this case, I'm showing a tissue culture example. And formulation A imparts some change on the test on the tissue culture makes some of them some of the cells fluorescent maybe and formulation b does that to a different extent right and we can quantify that using technologies for measuring cells uh, for example flow cytometry and see that there's a difference in effect of formulation a uh, compared to b right b looks like it's affected a bigger change on the cells than formulation a and I know there's no scientist that would do this without first controlling for the dose of the amount, you know, the amount of formulation A and B that's been applied to the test system, right? If you put 10 times as much of formulation B onto the cells than formulation A, it's natural you would get a different response, right? But that's not necessarily the experiment that you're trying to uh, do here. So really size, concentration, and payload, and measuring these things accurately is critical for doing basic good science. And that's where that's what motivates Spectrodyne. There are many technologies for measuring the output of this experiment for you know, characterizing cells, measuring cells and fluorescence, for example. But there are not a lot of appropriate technologies for measuring the input, the formulation, concentration, and the dose. Okay. So there are many available, however, and you're probably familiar with many of these. So uh, especially in LMPs, dynamic light scattering is a very common one. It's an averaging technique. Uh, there are a variety of surface imaging uh, techniques for measuring small particles now. There's nanoparticle tracking analysis, which is much more ubiquitous. Uh, 
Uh, and now even the flow cytometry companies and uh, instrumentation manufacturers are uh, developing nanoscale versions of their flow cytometry instruments, okay? Because this is such an important uh, metric, right? Size, concentration, phenotyping. Um, but there's some commonalities to these technologies that are worth noticing. So first of all, every one of these techniques uses optics, right? There are 100% optical measurements and they probably use light scattering to detect the particles in the sample, okay? And then infer things about their physical properties. So a 100% optical. Because of that though, because we're looking for nanoscale particles, these optical techniques are fundamentally limited at this size scale. That's basically because the small particles are smaller than the wavelengths of the light that are being used to look at them. And there's only so much you can learn about a particle using light that way with that scale mismatch, okay? You can make assumptions about samples in order to infer properties from them, but it's pretty indirect. And those assumptions fall apart completely if you're looking at, heter at a heterogeneous sample. So if you have LNPs that are mixed, you know, some of them are full and some of them are empty, they're going to have different um, optical properties. And so you won't be able to make these kinds of blanket assumptions for the whole sample uh, and have an accurate size concentration measurement as a result. EVs, you know, extracellular vesicles, obviously, they're produced in super heterogeneous samples, right? Tissue culture media, or maybe taken from bio uh, biofluids directly. Those kind of assumptions cannot be used in uh, for analysis of those kinds of samples and expect to get accurate results from it. Okay, so there's a critical need for direct in accurate measurements of EV size, concentration, and cargo. And that's exactly where Spectrodyne uh, comes in. So what I'm showing you here is our ARC particle analyzer. It makes direct and accurate measurements of size, concentration, and cargo using fluorescence, starting at about 50 nanometers and up. Uh, and importantly, there are no assumptions required for the accuracy of this technique. So it, the accuracy is independent of the refractive index of the particles the polydispersity of the sample, or even the heterogeneity. So you can mix different materials together in the same sample, same accuracy, okay. Um, and then practically the instrument's very fast and easy to use. There's no alignment or calibration or cleaning required of the instrument in between samples. Um, and it's compatible with, you know, all the flow cytometry protocols and reagents that maybe you're used to using already. So the way it works is uh, by leveraging the power of microfluidics, okay? And uh, in our instrument, we are uniquely combining two different methods. So inside the cartridge, what we do is we flow the sample through a constriction in the fluid path, okay? That's shown here. And the particles flow through one by one through this constriction. And every time a particle goes through the constriction, we get an electrical signal that tells us two things. One is how big the particle is, that's told by the, the amplitude of the signal. And then the other one is how quickly it went through the constriction. That tells us the flow rate of sample so that we know the volume of sample that we've measured. So we're measuring the volume of the sample and we're counting particles in that known volume. That's the most direct way of measuring concentration that exists, right? Number of particles per ml of sample. This technology, the MRPS system, has been available from Spectrodyne for about 10 years now in the form of the NCS1. And uh, we call this microfluidic implementation of resistive pulse sensing MRPS, microfluidic resistive pulse sensing. Now, recently, uh, in the last year and a half, we've launched our next gen technology, which is the ARC. And what we do in the ARC is we simultaneously shine a laser beam exactly at the sensing constriction to excite fluorescence in the particles. And then we detect the emitted fluorescence from each particle. So we use fluorescence, single particle fluorescence, that's quantitative to measure the amount of payload and to uh, uh, either on the surface in terms of targeting agents or maybe active ingredients on the surface of the particles uh, or internal payload this way. We can detect fluorescence in up to three different color channels simultaneously, right? So let me show you a very quick uh, representative raw data example to illustrate how this works. This is real data. And in the blue, blue uh, line, we're, we're showing the electrical signal over time. 
And two particles are being detected here. One's bigger than the other, right? And uh, you can see this first particle that comes through is a fluorescent particle and generates a signal in the um, all three of our fluorescent channels simultaneously with the electrical signal. And this particle here is non-fluorescent particle. This was a mixture of different polystyrene beads. This is non-fluorescent. And we know that because it doesn't generate any fluorescent signals uh, in the detection channels, okay? Um, importantly, these cartridges that we use, the microfluidic cartridges are very highly engineered. Uh, they include a feature that's very powerful, which is an input filter that excludes large particles from the sample before they reach the sensing constriction. Okay, and that allows ultimately our users, our customers to uh, analyze very complex samples on chip with very little sample prep. So you can run tissue culture media, biofluids like serum or plasma directly on chip without doing a lot of cleanup first. We focus on three key application areas. Today we'll talk about EVs. Um, and I just wanna point you to one recent publication showing uh, the ARC combined with flow cytometry, conventional flow cytometry. This is from researchers at the NIH, NCI. And I like this paper because it combines two orthogonal techniques to generate new information. And so I encourage you to go check out this paper. They derive the refractive, ind refractive index of EVs in a sample using these two methods. Okay, let me show you uh, one example of EV quantification on the ARC, and then I'll hand it over to Mickey, right? So this just illustrates the kinds of example, the kinds of experiments you can do with the ARC for EV applications. And in this example, what we're gonna use is a recombinant EV particle. Uh, these are commercially available from a company called Vesiki Lab. This, these EVs express a fusion protein between CD63, which is a common tetraspanin for EVs, right, and uh, GFP. So um, this is a transmembrane protein that also has, uh, that is also fluorescent then in this case, all right? When we measure this sample on the arc and look at the concentration versus size, so this is particle size distribution just in the native sample, this is the distribution we see, okay? It's a broad, uh, roughly power lot size distribution. We can be quantitative about the median diameter of the measured range and the concentration. It gets more interesting when we look at the fluorescence information. So in the inset, what I'm gonna show you here is the brightness of each particle on the y-axis uh, in our green channel. So this is where the GFP shows up, right? Um, and uh, versus the brightness in our yellow channel, which is where we're gonna stain for the CD63 with immunostaining, okay? And so what this already shows for the unlabeled samples is that many of the particles in the sample are fluorescent positive in the GFP, in the green channel, as expected, right? They're engineered that way. Um, and so these particles in this quadrant are positive. They're above our detection limit for GFP. And these ones are negative down here. Okay. Now it gets more interesting still when we stain for the CD63 with an antibody, right? So the staining process is very simple. You just add the antibody, incubate, and there's no washing afterwards. Adding the antibody does not appreciably change the particle size distribution, which is expected because we're just sticking a few antibodies on here. Um, and But it does significantly change the distribution of fluorescence intensities. So what we see is that pretty much every particle that would be expressing or that is expressing GFP, so everything above this line is fluorescent positive for GFP, also expresses PE now, or now it is fluorescent in our PE channel. And that's what we expect because it's a fusion protein between the GFP and the CD63. So when we label the CD63 with a PE conjugated antibody, the, everywhere that has GFP also has the CD63, right? There's also a population down here in the lower right quadrant that are positive for CD63, but negative for GFP. And we also express, expect that because it's an incomplete transfection of the cells that produce these EVs. So there's some wild type CD63 still in uh, on the EVs of these samples. And so not every particle expresses GFP, not everyone that expresses CD63 is also expressing GFP, that fusion protein. So we can be quantitative over any quadrant in this uh, plot, right? We can always plot the concentration versus size 
uh, for any subset of particles in the sample. And if we zero in just on the double positive ones, we can take it a step further and measure, use the fluorescence intensity to derive the number of epitopes of CD63 on each particle, right? So in the sample, what we see is that there's a peak in the distribution around three PEMESF. This is a quantitative fluorescence brightness unit. That's a NIST defined unit. And we can use that to infer that there are about three, um, uh, three molecules of CD63 per EV in this sample in the double, pop double positive population. Right. So what this example shows is that the arc is capable of direct and accurate EV quantification. Uh, it's also quantitative for fluorescence. We have very, it's basically very simple measurements, right? Size, concentration, and fluorescence brightness in all in real units. We've been able to quantify surface markers on the surface of these EVs. And what you didn't see here, but you can learn from a demo on our website is that the instrument's very fast and easy to use. Uh, to do this it takes about five minutes for a measurement. Okay, so um, with this, I will hand it over to Mickey. So let me give a brief introduction. Mickey is one of the most um, uh, enthusiastic and idea plentiful uh, biotech CEOs that I know. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you uh, in the webinar today. Um, he's going to show the variety of of um, techniques that Diadem uses in their development process, um, as well as all the different, I, I hope we'll get to hear some of your ideas for cool things to do with EVs and other nanoparticles. So um, at that, I will turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing and you can take it away, Mickey. Thanks. Thanks, Jean-Luc. Um, the feeling is mutual. I really, uh, I, I love what you've done. Um, and you've really created one of the, the most useful tools for for exosome analysis for sure and and now we're doing some things with lnps um so uh, um please feel free to email me after uh the webinar if anybody has any follow-up questions it's just mickey at dietembio.com um i'm going to move pretty quickly because i have a number of slides um but I don't think I have to give a, a, a huge amount of introduction to exosomes and EVs, but uh, basically I'll cover very briefly what are exosomes and EVs, what are the methods we use um, to purify and analyze exosomes or, or EVs, um, and then ways to engineer exosomes, and now um, exosome mimetic liposomes we've been playing around with uh, lately. Um, Exosomes are a subset of extracellular vesicles, um, and their nomenclature is hotly debated and their identity is hotly debated. I don't really want to get into those, um, those academic beefs, um, but, uh, but exosomes generally are deployed by every single cell in the body or even cells you culture in a dish. Um, and they're, they're often described as the FedEx of the body because they can carry um, really um, information dense biomolecules between uh, one cell and another, often at great distances and across tissue barriers. Exosomes, uh, we're now celebrating uh, the, about the 40th year of, uh, of exosomes, which were discovered in the early 1980s by a professor at McGill University, Rose Johnstone. And she was studying uh, reticulocyte maturation or hematopoiesis, the very last step of hematopoiesis. And if you're familiar with it, um, you know that in order to become a red blood cell, you have to jettison anything that's essentially non-essential for its function as an oxygen carrier, including a, a nucleus. And so she was studying a transferrin receptor and she found that transferrin receptor was on the surface of what she um, identified as exosomes, uh, small lipid vesicles that were released in bulk from a cell. And because of the process she was studying, for a long time, uh, people basically thought that exosomes were cellular garbage. Um, and I don't think she would refer to them as cellular garbage, but 
but but this kind of looks like you know somebody dumping some garbage out of the cell and getting rid of things that aren't needed um, but over the last 40 years we've recognized that exosomes play really really important roles um, across diverse um, uh, processes and functions of organs and signaling um, and disease states um, so you know uh, uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of people who are interested in exosomes as a diagnostic platform, right? Every exosome carries some signature of the cell from which it derives. So if it came from a cancer cell, you might be able to analyze that exosome and identify um, a cancer before it's even visible uh, uh, on a radiograph. Um, so you know, since exosomes carry nucleic acids, right, you could potentially use them as a liquid biopsy platform where you sequence and then you can actually um, find the, the biomarkers from the bulk information. What we're interested in um, is the potential to use exosomes therapeutically and to use their properties as natural signaling messengers um, to deliver therapeutic signaling. So uh, some of the buckets in the therapeutic use of uh, exosomes uh, for, for sure regenerative medicine. Um, so where delivering the stem cells themselves is difficult, onerous, or expensive, uh, many people are now looking at the exosomes because they can carry some, if not all, of the therapeutic properties of the cells themselves. Um, when they come from uh, stem cells such as mesenchymal stem cells, they, they tend to be powerfully anti-inflammatory. So there's a lot of interest, and this is where most of the clinical studies um, have ended up in the regenerative medicine space. But now bioengineers like myself are, are really interested in other ways of using exosomes, for example, drug delivery, non-viral gene therapies, um, vaccines, and in our case, we're focusing first on immunotherapies. So I just want to cover quickly um, some of the ways in which we analyze our exosomes and our engineered exosomes. Um, I hope some of these methods uh, will be helpful to you. The, uh, the kind of traditional way of harvesting exosomes or extracellular vesicles is ultracentrifugation. And I did my training as a virologist, so I know how time-intensive um, and tedious ultracentrifugation can be. Um, and so in our lab, we actually tend to use size exclusion chromatography most often to purify extracellular vesicles out of conditioned media from cells we grow in culture. Um, and the principle of size exclusion chromatography is that you have a resin in a column um, that allows the larger particles to come through first, where the smaller biomolecules and particles are actually bouncing around in the resin and come out later. So your earlier fractions tend to have your extracellular vesicles, which could be EVs or other types, uh, uh, exosomes or, or other types of EVs. And then, and then your later fractions tend to have your protein, DNA, RNA, things like that. And so, you know, a very simple process by which you could uh, purify exosomes from cell culture is you can culture your cells generally in basal media or in exosome depleted FBS containing media. Uh, we generally just filter the media to remove any particulate matter and then concentrate uh, the conditioned media either using an amicon centrifugal concentrator or tangential flow filtration, after which we separate our, 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 uh, the, by size using size exclusion chromatography. We tend to use um, pre-packed columns made by Izon, but you can also use basically any size exclusion resin on, on an FPLC um, if, if that's your preferred way. Izon also makes a, a convenient little fraction collector um, that you can use. And so this is basically the process that we use to um, purify our extracellular vesicles. Um, and, uh, and, and this is actually work that I had um, some high school interns do, which was to validate these columns um, for the purification of our extracellular vesicles. Um, and so uh, the first 
few mils of a, of a small column are the, are the void volume, just buffer running through, and then you start to get um, your, your fractions with your biomolecules. And so we saw if we measure total protein, you get a, a, a peak of total protein between fraction seven and nine. Um, and that actually uh, aligns with um, frac uh, uh, peaks of cholesterol, right? So cholesterol is a, is a component of the bilipid membrane of extracellular vesicles. Um, we, we saw that RNA largely segregated out. So these are extracellular RNAs that are in the conditioned media. But there was some DNA contamination in the, um, the fractions containing the um, extracellular vesicles. And we found that we could remove that by pre-treating our samples with a nuclease. So um, that's, that's one, uh, uh, one tip. Um, the other thing is we used a, a 10 kilodalton molecular weight cutoff to concentrate our conditioned media. So you see a lot of protein in those fractions about 13 to 15. Um, you can actually reduce that amount if you use a higher molecular weight cutoff. So 100 kilodalton will give you more exosomes relative to your uh, bulk protein. So by taking the, the fractions that we suspected had extracellular vesicles and we, we measured the size and concentration of the particles in there, and it also aligned with the, with the relative abundance that we saw in those fractions. So that fraction eight had the most number of particles um, followed by fraction seven and then nine. Um, so, so this indicates that we were purifying particles that are the expected size and, uh, and uh, components of um, exosomes or extracellular vesicles. So the example I showed you for measuring size and concentration was using tunable pulse resistive sensing using a Q-nano, which is also made by Izon. And it works uh, on, a, on essentially uh, the same principle as the NCS1 or the ARC platform, which is it's measuring resistance of a particle as it passes through a pore. In this case, it's a stretched nanopore. So you've got an added variable that you have to deal with, which is the size of the pore. Um, and so you can calibrate this system using standards of known size and known concentration. So we tend to use um, polystyrene particles that are 100 nanometers in diameter to calibrate this. So um, it's, it's, uh, it gives you a, a, a a concentration and a um, and a size based on those uh, standards that you use. But one of the things to keep in mind about TRPS and really almost any method that you use to measure nanoparticles is that there is clipping of the data at the lowest size ranges. And that depends on the amount of noise and the accuracy of which you can measure particles in those range. So we, um, as exosome researchers, when we do NTA or we do DLS or we do TRPS um, as ways of measuring extracellular vesicles, we're all used to seeing this peak um, um, around 100 nanometers. Um, in fact, um, that peak might be just an artificial um, a consequence of clipping the data uh, at the lower ends. Um, and, and this realization hit me very hard the first time we used the NCS1 because what we saw was at the lower uh, size ranges, the concentration was still very high. We never found a, a peak kind of mean or median particle size the way we do with other methods. And so I said, well, this can't be right. You know, what are we seeing on that, on that, um, on that lower end? But it turns out that if you if you um, crop the data from MRPS down to basically the same size range as you measure uh, using TRPS, you get very similar concentrations. And I would say anything that's less than an order of magnitude difference between two different orthogonal methods of measuring nanoparticles is actually pretty good. We tend to get an overestimation of particle numbers when we use uh, things like NTA. So this is something to keep in mind, but also for, for researchers working on extracellular vesicles or even nanoparticles, 
I think it's very important for the field, especially if you're doing dosing studies, to report your size range. Because what you detect as 10 to the ninth particles, someone else might detect as 10 to the 10th. So um, we really have to be clear about not only the concentration, but also the concentration within the size range that we're measuring. Um, another method that we use for single particle analysis that also gives us a size distribution is the ExoView platform, um, which is now sold under Unchained Labs. Um, it is an antibody functionalized chip um, that can measure particles um, by interferometry without any uh, secondary markers. So you can actually count and size particles by how they interact with light on this uh, a specialized, uh, very, very small chip. But then they also functionalize this chip with antibodies generally to the exosome tetraspanins, CD81, CD63, CD9, but there's other chips functionalized with different antibodies. So it's worth looking into if you have a different, uh, a different type of particle or if you're using virus and you wanna analyze virus. And once the particles are bound to the chip, you can basically counter stain them. So every single spot you see is a small immunofluorescence image of an individual particle with the overlay of antibodies for CD81, CD63, or CD9. Um, and so from this information, um, you can get a lot uh, uh, from from just these images in the analysis software, you can get a lot of rich information about your particles on a on a single particle level. And so, for example, you know, it's, it's somewhat like flow cytometry on a chip where you can actually plot the fluorescence intensity in any single channel. Um, uh, on, on each uh, uh, capture probe. One of the things that uh, I wanna mention, which, which Jean-Luc has already alluded to, which is if you look at these common markers that we associate with exosomes, the tetraspanins, you, you find that only a small proportion of the kind of bulk exosomes contain all three tetraspanins. Rather, most of them contain one or two tetraspanin types um, at most, or at least uh, a detectable types. And so I think this speaks really to the kind of heterogeneity of extracellular vesicles and things that are lost when we do bulk measurements. Uh, for example, if we do a Western blot on our preparations or, or some other type of, uh, uh, of bulk measurement, we lose this type of rich information. And, and Jean-Luc already showed um, some data with the CD63 GFP. Um, we also, uh, in his lab, stained um, our extracellular vesicles with an antibody to CD81, one of the, the tetraspanin markers. And again, we saw that, that only a, a, a fraction of the total particles um, staying positive with the CD81 antibody. So I think that speaks to the fact that there's heterogeneity uh, within a population of extracellular vesicles. So this is important to know if you're, if you're looking at various biomarkers. Another uh, a method that we've used quite successfully is the Maxplex EV kit made by Milteni. Um, and this consists of antibody functionalized beads that have various uh, uh, ratios of FITSI or PE fluorescence. So when you flow sort them on a regular flow cytometer, because these, these, particle, these uh, uh, beads are large like cells, you can actually see that they segregate into different populations uh, based on uh, the ratio of FITSI to PE. And you can gate on these populations. And so each of these populations has a different antibody to a different um, uh, exosome or EV uh, marker on the surface. And so they capture the EVs. And then you can come in with a secondary antibody. Generally, in the kit, they provide uh, antibodies to the tetraspanins. So it's a cocktail of antibodies against all three tetraspanins. And so you can basically say, of the particles that are beta-1 integrin positive, for example, 
um, what is the kind of relative amount of particles that also express at least one tetraspanin. And so you can get a sense of the surface epitopes. So this kit actually contains 37 different proteins. We've only shown here the ones that we detected on our exosomes um, from hex cells. Um, so this is a really uh, a useful technique. Um, and then as I'll show you in a few minutes, you can supplement this with other antibodies of your choice. So if you're engineering an exosome or, or, um, or, or an extracellular vesicle, you can actually come in with other antibodies and detect your, uh, your engineered molecule. So let's get into how we can engineer exosomes and things that are like exosomes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, exosomes appear to be released in bulk from cells and they come from a, from a compartment um, called uh, a, a uh, intraluminal vesicle or a multivesicular body where um, uh, parts of the plasma membrane are invaginated and then go to an endosome where they're invaginated again and then released um, out as exosomes. And so this, what this causes is a double flipping of the of the membrane curvature. Um, recent work out of the Gould lab um, suggests that uh, what we describe as exosomes may also come from the plasma membrane through direct budding, at least under circumstances where you're overexpressing certain exosome proteins. Um, but either way, the point I want to make in this diagram is that the topology of proteins on the plasma membrane is the same as the topology of proteins on exosomes or extracellular vesicles. That is, the outside remains outside and the inside remains inside. Um, so this is, this is important for engineering exosomes because you can basically take uh, transmembrane or membrane associated proteins and create fusion proteins um, where you have your protein of interest fused to the N um, or possibly the C terminus of the protein to either display on the surface or on, uh, on the inside of the extracellular vesicle. So here are some of the ones that are most commonly used in the literature. Lactadherin is not a transmembrane protein, but rather it binds to phosphatidylserine, which is enriched in exosome membranes. PTGFRN was discovered by Kodiak, another company, and it, and it seems to express really, really well, but it's also a very large and bulky uh, uh, protein. So um, as Jean-Luc mentioned, right, tetraspanins can be engineered. Um, they tend to be engineered at their N terminus or their C terminus inside the exosome or um, in an area of the large extracellular loop where you can insert polypeptides. Uh, we found um, that uh, probably the kind of easiest and most general way of loading a protein inside of an extracellular vesicle is just to fuse it with a meristylation or, pul or a palmitylation sequence, um, which is a lipidated uh, a sequence that embeds in the membrane. And there, there are proteins that naturally contain these. You can just take the sequences from these proteins and append it to the end terminus of your protein of interest, and it will get embedded in the, um, in the extracellular membrane. We, we showed this uh, with uh, fluorescent protein. We've also showed this with an with a enzyme, nanoluciferase, and it really works quite well. If you append a mercillation and palmitylation sequence to the end terminus of, in this case, M. scarlet, an RFP variant, um, and, and we subjected it to capture on a CD81 chips using the ExoView. Um, you, you don't see any fluorescent um, extracellular vesicles if they're not loaded with your protein of interest, if you're not expressing your pro the, uh, the M scarlet. But what we found was really, really bright uh, particles bound to the CD81 capture chip um, if they if they were from cells expressing this um, protein of interest, uh, uh, the the M scarlet, these cells are also very very brightly um, RFP uh, at their membrane. In this case, because of how um, these images are rendered, 
it's uh, it's shown in green um, based on the excitation rather than the emission spectrum. But these are these are in fact um, RFP positive particles. And so when we when we analyze the chips based on interferometry, because you can detect particles even if they're not fluorescent, um, we see that we get plenty of particles bound to the um, the chip from the unloaded extracellular vesicles, but none of them are fluorescent. Whereas we get at least 80% of them uh, appear to be fluorescent um, when, they're, when they express this uh, fusion protein. So this is a very efficient way of getting things into an extracellular vesicle, but it may not be the most specific to exosomes because um, it's just a kind of affinity tag. Um, the, the other thing, you know, so uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that most of the methods that are used for engineering extracellular vesicles, at least on the surface, um, utilize uh, type 1 transmembrane proteins, so that is proteins where their N terminus is sticking out and their C terminus is on the inside. And so um, that actually limits you to only really be if you if you're interested in like a signaling molecule that has to bind to a receptor right. Um, this limits you to only being able to display that signaling molecule with its N terminus out because um, you're making a C terminal fusion protein. Um, and 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 that's good for most people because uh, in the human genome, there's a few thousand type one transmembrane proteins, and there's only a few hundred type two transmembrane proteins. That is proteins with their C terminus facing out. Um, but some of these type two transmembrane proteins are are very important, especially in immunology. So we wanted to come up with a way of engineering extracellular vesicles with a type two transmembrane protein and. And, uh, it, and there wasn't a way in the literature that we could find. So we, uh, we purified uh, extracellular vesicles and we subjected them to, oh, sorry, uh, I'll just take a step back. Um, the reason we are interested in these type two transmembrane proteins is that they're um, intimately involved in generating cell to cell signaling between um, cells like antigen presenting cells and T cells. And so they're really important for immunological processes um, that occur at, for example, the so-called uh, immune synapse. Um, examples of these type two transmembrane proteins are all of the members of the TNF superfamily. So TNF alpha is a soluble protein, but all its relatives are membrane bound proteins. Um, and antibodies don't do a very good job of activating these receptors because um, the stoichiometry is incorrect and the clustering to form a signalosome um, uh, uh, is incapable with the, with the antibody. So we wanted to use extracellular vesicles as a chassis for delivering these types of proteins to cells of interest to, to modulate their behavior. Um, so in order to identify type 2 transmembrane proteins that were enriched on extracellular vesicles, we performed shock and proteomics to basically identify all the proteins that we could um, in, our, in our EV preparations. And then we used um, a, a bioinformatic tool called SURFY, S-U-R-F-Y or SURFY. Um, it's an in silico surfaceome, but it's basically a, a map of all the cell surface proteins um, and then we overlaid uh, the proteins that we found on our extracellular vesicles. So indeed, we identified as being highly enriched some of the proteins that were already identified, PTGFRN, EPCAM, and others. But we also were able to identify a few type 2 transmembrane proteins that are um, enriched on the exosome surface. One of these is CD98, which forms a, um, a heterodimer with LAT1 to, to, to form a, a transporter. But in the literature, we found that it's also a protein that interacts with beta-1 integrins. And since integrins are also highly enriched on um, extracellular vesicles, um, this was a great candidate for creating fusion proteins because we could utilize the fact that it's, it's highly expressed and interacts with other um, exosome proteins. So we, we use this now to engineer um, multi-domain chimeric proteins with very specific um, 
signaling molecules on their surface, and one of them is called GitRL. It's a, it's a relative of TNF-alpha, um, and it's membrane-bound. It forms trimers, so we engineered it um, as a single-chain trimer. Um, if you predict the structure with alpha fold, it looks just like a trimeric uh, molecule, and it matches very well with the, the already solved structures. Using size exclusion chromatography, we can see that the particles um, in those early EV fractions also are enriched for our GitRL um, expression as well as CD81 um, and exosome tetraspanin. And when we use ex, uh, ExoView to, to look at these particles um, on a single particle basis, it's very hard to see them in the unmodified. You can kind of see it a little bit. Um, but the software is able to discern where the particles are um, and put a circle around them um, based on whether or not they're, they're larger than 50 nanometers in diameter. But our engineered extracellular vesicles can be counterstained with an anti-GitRL antibody and they're quite bright. So this shows us that um, we are in fact engineering individual particles likely exosomes based on the tetraspanin expression um, and that we can identify them um, on a single particle level. Using uh, the flow cytometry method I discussed using the capture beads, we were able to add in a second antibody um, in a different, uh, a different excitation and emission wavelength for, for GitRL. And so now we're able to show that the particles that are um, are trapped by these beads, um, contain both the tetraspanins as well as our engineered protein of interest. Um, so, so again, as Jean-Luc mentioned, orthogonal methods to characterize um, uh, your engineered particles. This is an example of a bioassay that shows the function of these engineered extracellular vesicles. We use an engineered GERCAT T cell that expresses GITR, the receptor, and a downstream response element that drives luciferase. And if you add antibodies or other recombinant protein agonists of GITR, you can get some signaling. And if you add our extracellular vesicles that are decorated with the agonist for this, for this receptor, you also um, induce signaling and you get the production of luciferase by adding a substrate, um, it produces light and you can measure those relative light units um, and get a very nice dose response curve. And so what we found is compared to a, an agonist antibody, this is actually a clinical stage antibody being developed by a major pharma company, we were able to really surpass um, the amount of signaling that we could get. And this is normalized to the individual molecule. So on a per molecule basis, decorating an extracellular vesicle in this multivalent manner actually produces stronger signaling and more effective signaling. And so we're now exploring the use of these engineered extracellular vesicles as immunotherapy agents because we can, um, in theory, activate the types of T cells that are important for an anti-cancer response. So um, I, I'm just going to finish up the last few slides um, and mention that we have started exploring other ways of engineering extracellular vesicles using a, a, a post-purification method. So rather than expressing the, the protein of interest or, or the molecule of interest in the cells, we want to be able to purify our extracellular vesicles on the one hand and then just mix them with with a, um, a, a drug or a molecule of interest. In this case, what we did is we, we synthesized the DNA oligo that had a lipid moiety on the, um, on the five prime and a fluorochrome, in this case, it was Alexafluor 488 um, on the three prime end. So this uh, DNA oligo is, a, is an antisense oligo for a, for a transcription factor that we're interested in. But essentially, this could be any type of DNA or RNA oligo, including an aptamer. Right, so if you wanted to create a targeted aptamer to uh, to to uh, your uh, target of choice, you could have an aptamer made, conjugated to a lipid, 
and then mix it with your extracellular vesicles. And so when we mixed it at various concentrations and used size exclusion chromatography, we could see fluorescent peaks in our exosome fractions. Um, and that corresponded to the brightness of the sample. Um, but what was really spectacular was when we measured these particles on the ARC platform, we could actually show that our unmodified extracellular vesicles essentially had no detectable fluorescence, um, but that our engineered extracellular vesicles with this um, conjugated uh, fluorescent oligo um, had increased fluorescence in a dose dependent manner so that the more oligo we incubated with our extracellular vesicles, the more oligo per particle we got on them. Um, in retrospect, we should have used FITSI because this is actually calibrated to the number of FITSI molecules. But because Alexafluor 488 is about six times um, as bright as FITSI, we can actually just divide the uh, FL1 brightness by six to, to actually calculate the, the rough number of oligos that we've inserted into the membrane. So if you have a thousand, right, we're talking about 330 molecules, which is pretty good. That's a, that's a high level of drug loading if you're, if you're interested in that. And we wanted to see if this was generalizable. So we purchased um, a, an EV mimetic LNP. So this is an LNP that basically has the lipid composition of an extracellular vesicle, but that's it. No proteins, no microRNAs, none of the other cargo. Um, and when we incubated the DNA oligo with these EV mimetic LNPs and purified them using size exclusion, we again saw that we could load them quite effectively. And, and here um, you see the size distribution is slightly different from the extracellular vesicles, but they, they loaded quite well with the, uh, with the fluorescent oligo. So this opens up a lot of opportunities for us to not only genetically engineer our extracellular vesicles, but also do post-production engineering. Um, I will just leave this slide up um, for you to read, um, but I'm happy to take questions at this point. Um, I hope you can appreciate there are many ways of engineering extracellular vesicles, including genetic engineering or post-production engineering, uh, liposomes or their predecessor, the, the LNP can be engineered through a number of functionalizations and chemistries. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. Um, so we are exploring both approaches as ways of creating uh, immunotherapies. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for great talks. And ladies and gentlemen, we can take questions now. And um, there's the questions in the Q&A box that Jean-Luc can read and address. So you can type those in. Also, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. So uh, Jean-Luc, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mickey. That was really fascinating. Uh, there's so many dimensions to this. It's really cool to see such a good summary of that and what you're after those uh, any sense all the ghosts are really neat. Um, here's a question from the Q&A from Stephen Droho. Thanks for your question, Stephen. Uh, is there any way to determine if some of the EV heterogeneity is due to incomplete exposure of the tetraspanin epitopes to the surface? And um, that's a good question. I saw this. I've been thinking about <laughs> how to answer that. I think, you know, for our, from our platform, we need to be able to make the tetraspan and fluorescent, right? Um, or, uh, and so typically that's done with an antibody. Um, maybe you have another way. So you, you'd have to maybe, I don't know, disrupt the structure in order to detect a difference in the labeling efficiency, right? Um, that way. Do you have any other ideas, Mickey? Yeah, so um, I think this is a great question, and it's one that we've grappled with um, a bit. So, you know, tetraspanins are, they're multi-pass proteins, they're highly glycosylated, at least in the, in the case of CD63. Um, different antibodies um, detect them better than others. Um, so it's a real challenge finding I think the right antibody that has 
the right affinity to an exposed epitope to your extracellular vesicle. Um, so I think part of the challenge is the heterogeneity might be just due to inability to saturate your staining. Um, another challenge with um, with uh, with the tetraspanins, which we've we've we think we've observed, but you know we don't have definitive proof using the uh, Exoview platform, is that by virtue of capturing your extracellular vesicles with an antibody to a tetraspanin, you might actually be sequestering that tetraspanin away from your counter staining detection antibodies. So that's a challenge that, that you have to keep in mind. Now, I will say using the ARC platform, um, because you're not immobilizing and you're not capturing uh, the extracellular vesicles, you might have a better shot at accurately measuring the number of tetraspanin molecules on the surface of an extracellular vesicle. Um, there are other methods, for example, uh, super resolution microscopy methods that are that are now used to try to detect individual tetraspanins. So I hope that that answered your question by way of saying we don't really know and it's probably a combination of the efficiency of your reagents and the method you're using. Um, but nonetheless, I think that there is probably intrinsic heterogeneity. Um, the thing about tetraspanins is they're, they're often drawn as very boxy-like, but they're actually kind of wedge-shaped. And so they either cause membrane deformation or they sense membrane deformation. So it seems to be that the incorporation of, of exosomes seems to have some stochastic, uh, sorry, the incorporation of tetraspanin seems to be a bit stochastic in nature, so that some particles may just have more CD9 than CD81, and others will have more CD81 than CD9. So, right. those are my thoughts. Thanks. One one that occurred to me during while you were talking was um, uh, you could compare the ex, you know a measurement of the exposed protein with something like the ARC or the um, uh, other ones, but, um, and then compare with the total protein with a Western, right? Like a denaturing example. So then if you see significantly more with a Western after denaturing all the particles, then that might suggest that a significant fraction of them are not accessible, you know, in the native structure. The, I think that's related to the, the follow-up question, which was, can the, can the EV's cargo be different based on the tetraspanin's availability? And I think essentially they're the same, right? Uh, like the the amount of active ingredient you have, if that's a tetraspanin, right, is is dependent on how available it is on the particles, also, right? The the practical amount of it or the the bioactive amount of it, in order for it to do its job, it's got to be available. So those are similar. I think in the case of when you're fusing a cargo to a tetraspan in itself, um, certainly I think the the EV's cargo can be different based on the tetraspanin's expression. So if you're using CD63 to, you know, like the CD63 GFP, right, we can see quite clearly that um, it's only on a subset of uh, extracellular vesicles. Um, so that could be an expression issue, but it could also be just the fact that some extracellular vesicles don't have that tetraspanin. Right. Um, okay. We've also seen that um, the cargo can be different, at least in the sense of a protein cargo, if you have a fusion protein that interacts with other exosome molecules. So again, going back to why we chose um, a certain type two transmembrane protein, we knew it interacted with integrins. So we, we suspected that it might have um, better incorporation because of that fact. And actually, when we look at, um, when we look at our flow cytometry, we actually see that um, the in beta one integrin containing um, uh, um, particles that get trapped on a bead tend not to have very much tetraspanin compared to the CD9 or CD63 or CD81 particles. 
they don't have as much, they're not as highly enriched for tetraspanins on average, right? This is an averaging, um, but they still express good levels of our GitRL trans proteins. So what that suggests to me is that there might be something about the interaction between those proteins that have them slightly more enriched on those, that subset of particles. Thanks. We're just about out of time. There's one more question with two parts. Uh, I can answer my part quickly. So um, it says, uh, would you say there's a need to run an unknown EV sample through multiple cartridges to get a comprehensive overview of the sample, given the fact that cartridges contain internal filters? So um, quick answer to that is that each cartridge type is you know, defined as Mickey talked about to a certain measurement range, right? On the lower limit, it's, de it's determined by the sensitivity of the cartridge. And on the upper limit, it's determined by that filter. So it's called a well-defined measurement size range. In order to go beyond that, you need to use a different size cartridge, right? And then they overlap and the data stitches together naturally. Um, most of the time in practice, our users end up focusing on a certain range of interest um, and uh, they just use a single cartridge type to analyze their samples. Then uh, the second part of the question is to Mickey, we've observed a lot of issues attempting to introduce material into EVs. Some kids claim to allow that, but they do not hold under systemic scrutiny. Would you be open to discussing effective introduction of siRNA into EVs? And I don't know if you feel like that's a quick one to answer or not, but we can uh, say your email address again. Yeah, also. well, it, I can answer it relatively quickly and, cool. and anybody who's not interested, please feel free to jump off the webinar. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, siRNA is right and RNA in general is, is subject to degradation. So you want to put it into an exosome or a lipid particle, liposome, something like that. Um, we have not done extensive work trying to load with siRNAs. And part of the reason is when we looked at the literature, none of the methods looked very efficient, right? You can electroporate them, you can fuse them with liposomes. There are various methods and kits um, to do that. But, but we were never very impressed with the amount that you could get into, um, into an exosome. So I think in my mind, you know, my kind of personal mantra is don't try to make an exosome do something that a liposome can do better. Um, and so in, in this case, I would probably be using a liposome and trying to functionalize that liposome for targeting rather than trying to force an siRNA into an extracellular vesicle. So broadly, I would say I'm agnostic. Um, and and not very helpful, but I, I certainly would be happy for an offline conversation. Great. Well, I uh, just want to say thanks again to uh, you, Mickey, for joining us today and providing such uh, stimulating content. And uh, to everyone who's attended and given your time for that, please follow up uh, by email. Our information's here, and um, we look forward to hearing from you again. Thanks again, Mickey. Great. Thank you. Bye.